What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? Dr. Marissa Porges, it's great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Great to be here. Uh, I've heard that you teach a class at your school for the seniors focused on leadership. And so first, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the curriculum of that class, some of the key takeaways for the girls to uh, are becoming women in that class that you share with them and what what made you as the head of the school decide to then also be uh, to teach a class amongst all the other responsibilities you have. So uh, that it's a question I love you asking to start the show because um, I spent so much time over the past couple of years developing that course um, in large part because it's something that I wish I'd had when I was a teenager. I mean, I think a lot of the lessons that I learned um, as a leader um, at different points in my career were very much, you know, on the job training and those things that I then look back and said, oh, like if only I had known, you know, how to negotiate better, how to sort of like, um, you know, solve this sort of problem or deal with this sort of, you know, difference in a work context or what that looked like. Um, and so it very much was something that I think our girls should have, our kids should have. Um, and I developed it over the past couple of years as that a bridge to um, our teenage girls as they're looking at the real world. So they think about college, but they're really focused on the world around them. Kids today are so more in tune with the what's going on. And so we do it at two levels. At first we talk about sort of like, you know, what you would take if you took a one-on-one on leadership through the philosophical lens, right? We read a couple of readings, we sort of talk about what it means to be a leader, what kind of leadership qualities in the general sense um, they want to have. Um, and then we actually do case studies. We pull up, um, you know, they get to choose everyone from Angela Merkel to Marissa Mayer to, you know, Michelle Obama, and they dig into what those leaders look like from afar and how they're both criticized and applauded. And we talk about the why, like what is it that makes them effective or ineffective as a leader? Um, and then there's actually a third part, and this is a lot of what I get to in the book is the skills that it you need to be an effective leader. I mean, I think we sometimes overlook those and we ha I have the girls practice. We actually do, um, you know, a practice, go to a coffee and have a, a conversation with somebody you admire and, and see where it goes. We do practice emails to somebody to introduce yourself. This idea that they need to learn early on the muscle memory that it takes to be effective um, as a leader, I think is incredibly important. So those are the multiple parts of the course. Okay. This is probably good for anybody, but when you practice going to meet for the 15, 20 minute coffee. Let's get tactical for a second, uh, Marissa. So what are some of the things you teach to, to do well at uh, the first coffee meeting with someone? Oh, it's so funny. And this again, it's, it's come out of years of people, me doing it with others. And then as I got you know more senior over time, um, young folks just early in the career doing for me, and I saw the things that they struggled with. Um, and I literally still to this day, if I'm doing a coffee with somebody, I will at the end be like, okay, now that we're done, I'm going to give you a little bit of feedback. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big on feedback. So I'm not good. Um, so it's, it is tactical. It's everything from, you know, make sure you have gotten to the coffee shop early and positioned yourself close, you know, somewhere where you can see them walk in, Google them beforehand to see what they look like, but someplace where it's going to be quiet and private so you can have a conversation, right? Everything from that to literally I talk about what they should order when they get to the front of the line because I've been struck in, in moments when um, the young person, a young professional struggles and suddenly orders the most, the fanciest coffee um, on the menu. And we're sitting there for 15 minutes with the barista waiting rather than having the conversation they really were there for. So we talk about everything from that to what you want out of the conversation. And I, and I, we strategize about, you know, particularly for somebody who's young, early in the career or a young professional just out of college, the idea that you want something you want to make yourself available to help that person. You want to ask for an introduction to somebody else they may know. You want to you know, insert something here that gives you um, the ability to develop that individual as not just a one-off coffee in person, but a mentor or hopefully over time a sponsor. And I think that's, those are the tricks of the trade, so to speak, that I learned over time that 
men and women, you know, girls and boys can learn younger um, and, you know, sort of become more effective leaders as they get older. It, is there, or what, I guess I should say, what is the difference for, let's, let's fast forward a little bit. Cause you, you know, your book's all about what girls need, how to raise bold, courageous and re resilient women. So let's say a, a recent college graduate, and I want to hear about the differences between if it's a guy or a girl uh, showing up for that first interaction, whether it's at co coffee or the first interview, perhaps, what are some of the key differences that are worth knowing both? I'm thinking this from both sides, Marissa, the person who is maybe the mentor or the interviewer, so they can, th I want them to be more aware yep. of, and, and I want to focus this mainly on, on the females, but I still, I still think it's worth it for us to talk about both because both of those types are listening right now. So what are some of the keys for that first interaction and maybe the differences for a girl versus a guy? Yeah, it's such an important point um, to draw out and talk about because there are differences. I mean, mm -hmm. for the first point, um, women, statistically speaking, research shows um, uh, are have less mentors, are less effective at mentoring, have fewer sponsors. And yet, you know, every study has shown that the more mentors you have and the more sponsors, right, the difference of someone who's going to put you forward to the job, not just give you advice about a job, the more successful you'll be, the more promotions you get, the further you go in a career path. Um, and so I think for the first point, it, you know, on for young girls or young women um, or any, any woman, I say this to myself sometimes, you need to, mentorship has to be um, something you do on a regular basis, rather, uh, sorry, seeking mentors. Um, this idea that it is um, not, uh, it needs to be on your to-do list, right? Like yeah. I encourage folks, you know, set something in your calendar once a month or, and- Men spend, and women mentors. Men and women. Right. So, and this is sort of crossing gender lines, right? And so the difference is for, you know, men listening, be very conscious to include women in your mentorship circle in men, as mentees. We have natural biases that, um, that, uh, that would um, propel us to usually mentor folks who have something similar to us in our background, whether it's because you went to the same college or high school or grew up in the same area or um, again, studies show because you're same gender or you have similar you know, passions. Um, and yet this, and because of um, gender dynamics and a lot of the historically male workplaces, uh, there's still barriers to entry for young women. Um, it makes it harder for women to find mentors. Um, and so I do think on, on the side of managers to think, you know, are you making room on your, your list of mentees, the list of people that you say, you know, let's get, grab a coffee and talk about your career. Um, you know, do you do that for women as well? Um, and then for young women to make sure you are actively asking for those moments. And I think um, women are, are less likely to make that ask, um, not least because it feels like you're encroaching on someone else's time. And I just encourage listeners everywhere to think that that is something that every everyone in their career has had others do for them at some point and it's what we have to do to pay back to the next generation and frankly from a selfish perspective sometimes you find gems that help you know that give you information or sort of you know inspire you to other things and so you know just know that that's what you're doing as well even when someone else is buying you the coffee so marissa i'm a little bit nervous to ask my next question um, and I'll pause for effect since we're on audio. Uh, what about for the guy listening who was a bit nervous about this because of what's gone on in the world? Uh, they may think it could be inappropriate to be out to lunch with a younger female. And they say, you know what? It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it to, to go there because bad, something bad could happen, even if my intentions are 100% pure and great. And they say, I saw my buddy, he did nothing wrong and something happened, or maybe he did, but they're like, forget it. I'm just not going to deal with it. I mean, this is the things that are said. I've heard people say this. Uh, I, and so it's worth us talking about because it's out there. People are thinking it in their head. And I'd love to, uh, it was one of the things I wanted to hopefully bring up with, with you. And fortunately, you've made me comfortable enough to say it pretty quickly. But what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, it is, you know, it's the reality, right? And it's the unfortunate reality because um, for every um, man or woman who is afraid of that moment, 
um, there's doors closing for the next generation of young women who, yeah. who want to po- follow the leadership example of their male mentors or their male bosses or other people in their lives. Um, and so this is where, you know, I'm a very practical, pragmatic person and a practical, pragmatic leader in, in terms of, I think of it tactically. I mean, you know, this is where being very conscious of um, the, where you meet, you know, what you say, and, and that should be the reality of it, you know, across the board, right? And so it's a, yes, you should be meeting at a coffee shop, you should be meeting in a, a public place, but um, I would hope we would be doing that anyway. Um, you know, yes, it should be, you know, conversations about, you know, work and the, the things that would be on the resume, not the things that aren't off the resume. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the things that we, I would think that most of your listeners are are doing already and have done um, and know that they're doing the right thing, um, that's, you have to trust in that. And, and I do think that um, for the most part, from everything I've seen, that still works, right? And there's, you know, young women up and coming who want that and aren't going to see it as an opportunity to sort of put you in an awkward position, who really just want their, their boss, man or woman, to mentor them to say, hey, you know, it's our yearly review, let's block time for your career talk, right? I do it with my, my assistant, right? Once a year, we have a conversation and we don't do it at the office because I feel like it gets you out of the work environment. We go to a coffee shop and we say, okay, right? Let's talk about your career. Where do you, what, what happens next? Um, and we sort of, again, you know, he'll be doing this for a number of years, but he will, is off to be a leader himself one day. And when I think, recognizing that you know people did that for us for everyone listening i'm sure um i and not to not to be afraid because um i i just i it worries me for the next generation of young women to think yeah. that that would be the case something something you've you've written in your book which i really like you said you don't have to be a feminist to care about these lessons nor do you need a daughter or a sister you just have to know a girl or a young woman and care about her future i think that that says it perfectly to everyone and to everyone listening regardless of your family structure or your dynamic of 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 why this is valuable and i will point out there's a lot of science i've written about this in my first book i remember doing heavy research the stats prove the more women leaders you have the more successful and productive and better your business will be the, the the all of the research backs that up too so all if you only care about the numbers and you only care about your business going like this i'm pointing upwards you'd hire more women so i i think you it, it kind of hits it from all angles i guess yeah i mean again it whether it's because you want to make sure your daughter or your wife or your sister um, has all the opportunities you've had or from the bottom line perspective, the profit loss perspective, or, you know, from, you know, the sense that uh, women pr- lend a perspective, problem solve differently, collaborate differently, and, you know, can really be the, someone at the table you need in those moments, whether it's a crisis or sort of an opportunity moment. Um, and so, you know, we all need collectively to make sure that the next generation gets those opportunities. So yes, it can be either self-serving or selfless. Yes. Uh, okay. I want to go to um, chapter six in your book. Um, okay. Your ability to adapt will be key or her ability to adapt will be key is, is what it's titled. And I, and, and I want to, I'm going to set the stage and then let you finish the story. Okay. So it's your second day as a Navy midshipman, um, your first day in uniform uh, during a week of indoctrination training that was meant to mirror boot camp, And you were sitting in a barber's chair tall swivel chair and you were sinking into your seat and tears welled up into your eyes you were 17 years old take us to that moment and what wow was you went right for it ryan it <laughs> took me the entire book it's one of the later chapters to get to this story because it's a very personal one um but uh it's a a very important one because um it speaks to both uh moments of failure that we all need to overcome and how we teach you know lessons learned and teaching the next generation about that. Um, and then uh, a really important lesson front and center right now, as we're all wrestling with the new realities of life um, about the key, um, the key skill of adaptability for leaders, um, both at home and in the workplace. Um, and so the, the story that Ryan started telling was um, when I um, had just, uh, again, put on the uniform, I um, joined the Navy shortly after high school. Um, and so I did ROTC in college. 
Um, it had been my dream uh, from a, a young age to fly uh, jets off carriers. For anyone listening who grew up in the era of Top Gun, best recruiting movie ever, exactly. So your yours truly was hoping to be Goose or Maverick. Um, the stepping stone to get there was I did ROTC in college. Um, and one of the first things they do, do when you're sort of, after you put your uniform on is of course, make sure you're up to snuff, that your hair is according to code, that if you're a young woman, you can put it back in a strict bun. And if you're a young man, it sort of meets military standards. Um, and um, the, the missing piece for me was a couple of weeks prior to indoctrination, I'd um, gotten into a, a pretty um, terrific, uh, right, horrific, excuse me, um, car accident. Um, and I was fortunate to um, have um, local emergency responders find me pretty quickly um, and, you know, jaws of life extricate me and sort of there's a story for that one as well. But the crux of the matter was I had a bit of a wonky haircut going into Navy training because it uh, might have to have um, brain surgery and a couple other things. And long story short, I was very sensitive about it, as you might imagine, a young, a young girl, 17 years old first, you know, off to college, sort of, that was my, you know, first foray into this new world, right? I was adapting both to college, being away from home, joining the Navy, something totally new to me, um, wasn't from a military family. And, and here the second day in uniform, they marched me with all the boys because I, uh, to the barber shop to have my head shaved because I couldn't get my hair, my, had been cut off in surgery and wasn't long enough to put in a bun. And needless to say, um, Tears ensued. Um, I don't think the barber knew what to do about it, um, but uh, I've often reflected on that moment, right? Because it's it's just this one turning point for me that I think we all have this, where something is so jarring, so front and center, so tangible to us um, that it makes us feel in a moment how we have to change ourselves, either our, our identity or how we have to adapt to new things. and. Um, and I think it's all about what we do next, right? So that story opened the chapter because for me, it was a turning point into how I then had to adapt um, in college, in the Navy, through the rest of my career. Um, and then there's, it speaks to a lot of what I think we all have to do now, right? In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of sort of, you know, things outside of our control that we all um, need to respond to as leaders, right? And how we run organizations in this. So then there's a whole other story we can get to there in terms of what would he, what we do about it, but that's why that story was important for the book. I was told by a mentor of mine, a, a really a sponsor of mine, very earlier in my career, he said, "Develop the skill to adapt." And I remember thinking, I was young, out of college, I finished just finished playing football. I was like, "What does that mean?" You know, he's like, "Develop the skill to adapt to an ever changing situation because that's the world," and. One day, a senior guy will come in and say, and he did say this, a senior guy will come in and say, hey, you know, we're going to stop selling this and start selling this and you got to get good at it today, right? And so you got to adapt and learn and, and not pout or cry about, no, I was really good about selling that other thing. I want to, you know, that, that's not the way that it works. And, and so I, I, I kind of learned that and I learned some of that through sports and I realized how that transferred into the business world. What are some of the keys for a leader in general to, to, to adapt, to, to, to develop skills, to adapt? Like what are some practical ways we can do this? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, great to hear that somebody had put that out to you early on because you're right. It's the reality we're all facing, whether it's um, a boss coming in and saying you're doing something new or whether it's the fact that every year, every month, we're having to adapt to new technology. We're having to learn and relearn how to do our jobs amidst a pandemic or other things. We're um, you know, all changing jobs more often, right? Studies show that those just starting out in the workforce are gonna change jobs possibly four times more often than their parents or grandparents by the time they're 40. Right? It's crazy to think about. And each time they pivot, they have to learn a new team. They have to learn a new, you know, new set of standards, new technology, new ways of communicating. Right. So how do we do it? Right. And this is where I think um, we can start young, um, but also the skills with, that come with how we teach our girls or our, our boys to our, our sons um, about adapting can apply to us too. Right. So one, it's about being open to pushing yourself into new environments, right? And so this is where for our daughters, I 
suggest, you know, the next time you get that, the list for, you know, what class she's going to be in for school, and we sort of the natural tendency of parents to say, oh, we want the other class, it's her favorite teacher, or she wants the class where her friends are in. No, 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 right? This is a safe way, a very safe opportunity for her to test herself in new different environments. You know, it's the same thing, whether she's, you know, if she's joining to your, use your a sports analogy, joining a soccer team or the local sports team, your son joining the little league um, or going to a summer camp uh, or something with your, your church or synagogue or mosque, right? Those are all opportunities where you can help her or your son branch out and try something slightly different in a very safe way. So you choose the camp that it's not the one her friend, friends are going to, but where she's gonna have to push herself, right? Or when we think about it for ourselves, just think about the little ways we can do things differently, right? Instead of, I mean, it's, all, it's, it's simple enough as like changing your routine and testing your boundaries in that way. Um, and every time you do that, you're building the muscle memory that it takes to adapt to change, to communicate with different people in different moments, um, to respond effectively when you don't know really, when there's uncertainty. Those are the key skills that come with adapting um, and again, there's, a, there's social science research just starting now to really dig into it because CEOs on down have shown and have realized that it's the key skill they're hiring for and need in future leaders. One of your skills that you've developed, and uh, I read about this because you, you, you did it when you were conducting counterterrorism operations in Yemen and Saudi Arabia and other places, is your ability to authentically empathize with people and the even people uh commented in other countries that you were much better at this than the guys mm -hmm. and that this became one of your superpowers um you developed this skill and it made you better than anybody else at doing this job of being uh, able to authentically empathize can you share more about this skill and how mm -hmm. one I, I know that girls can use this to their advantage, but just people in general, how we all can get better at this. Yeah, um, I think empathy is is every, should be everyone's secret superpower. I think it will be the key for those listening from how you move from you know any management position to the next level up, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the big leadership levels that we see in our organizations, um, being an empathetic leader is really um, been proven to be. Um, so impactful to the, not just like to the morale of your, your group, but to the bottom line too, right? Mm -hmm. Because you understand what it is your people need to hear, what your customers are looking for, and then you respond to that in a really effective, powerful way. Um, so, you know, I think, um, and I do think it net comes more naturally to young girls and, and women, um, because a lot of it is how we're socialized to communicate early on, um, how we often um, are, you know, sort of how it's normalized for us to take into account what other people are thinking, whether it's classmates or friends or sort of the, the person at, at your play date when you're uh, very young. Um, and those ways of thinking and, and um, those habits, um, that idea that it's not just what to take the golden rule. It's not just actually, it's not actually the golden rule of what you want done uh, to yourself. It's what other people want done for them, right? That's the transition for the platinum rule, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. There you go, the platinum rule. Thank you. Um, and so, what does that mean for um, leaders? I think it means um, thinking differently about how and when we communicate. Um, and this is just sort of thinking of how you use your communication tools with your peers and um, your teams um, to be really authentic, to understand that them seeing you as a real person um, is going to make them both connect with you and connect with your group's mission and then be more effective themselves. Um, I think it's also about how we are in those moments vulnerable. Um, and this is, you know, where, and I've had, it took me a little bit of time, I, I'll be honest, to get used to this. It's not, it doesn't come natural to me. This idea of, it's not just letting your guard down, but it's sort of sharing about yourself. It's um, sort of the moment that um, you sort of you referenced um, in the that I speak to in the book um, when I was overseas in Yemen, I'm um, doing research on counterterrorism and literally sitting down with um, Al Qaeda terrorists and um, to hear their stories. Right, a crazy thing to do as a American, a crazy thing to do as an American woman, um, a particularly crazy thing to do as a, a young American female who's Jewish. 
right? Who's a practicing Jew, not something you're supposed to be, you know, doing breaking bread with Al Qaeda terrorists who, you know, by their mandate are sort of, uh, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not on the same side. So we, we'll put it that way. Um, but I, you know, I can remember the moments when I shared personal information about myself, um, that it was the thing that broke through and allowed us to communicate more clearly with each other because then they thought it was okay to be vulnerable too. And now mind you, you have to choose your moments, right? In the same way that for every leader listening, you're not oversharing, right? There's a professional boundary too, but it's just this idea that sharing vulnerabilities um, is a way to connect with others and actually empowers you as a leader um, because it makes your people both relate to you and understand that you want to relate to them, right? It's a two-sided, you know, it's both sides of the equation. Um, and then they'll buy into you and they'll buy into your team and your mission even more. So I just, yeah, go ahead. I think there's this thin line though, and it's hard, it's much harder for women than it is for men when it comes to this being vulnerable, because if you cross the line, again, I think the, the line almost doesn't exist for guys for most part, like guys can be self-critical and talk down about themselves and people will laugh and, and i mean i do i do this they, they laugh and but sometimes like my wife will do it and she's and i'm not just saying this people know she's actually been on the show she's far more intelligent and a, and a and and tougher than i am um and and it could it, it doesn't work the same way uh where she'll be critical about something she does and i and i don't and you have to be like, don't do that, even though I can do that. And so I'm, I'm wondering, how, how does this, this is delicate, I realize, but how does this work for, for both the guys and the girls listening when it comes to this sharing where, where maybe you have imposter syndrome, or maybe you're vulnerable about what vulnerable about something like how does this work? Yeah, well, and I think that the subtle difference for women, and this is, um, you know, I learned over time, you have to be conscious about when and conscientious about how you are vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, right? And this is where it becomes, uh, it really becomes a, a strategy to utilize and not just a way of being, which is, a, you know, and yeah. I don't want to make it sound like a, a bad thing, but I think it's just a recognition that if you, you know, if you are that way too often or sort of if it becomes sort of your, um, almost like a verbal tick, but in sort of an emotional way, um, then it doesn't work to maximum of effect, right? The, the idea here is um, in some ways to almost take the emotion out of being vulnerable. Um, and, you know, in the same way that telling the story I just told um, years ago would have upset me, right? It, it wasn't, I wasn't at the point where I was comfortable as a leader being vulnerable or sharing my failures in the same way that I've now learned to do in part by writing this book where I had to write them down and start talking about them and, and realize that, you know, not least of which is that they weren't such big deals, right? They were little things in the scheme of things, but um, well, I mean, maybe, maybe not, I suppose. But the idea that um, I now understand them for what they are um, and can take the emotion out even in, as I'm saying it, right? And so this is where it's not about, you know, crying or getting emotional at work, but it's about sharing a little piece of who you are yeah. um, in order to connect with your audience. Um, and I think, you know, I'm sure in the same way for when you're doing your interviews and podcasts, Brian, or when you're on, you know, giving your, your speeches and talks, I think we all realize that those moments um, where we are as true to ourselves as, um, you know, as people want us to be, are the, are the ways you find true power. And so I do think for women, it's just about being very conscious about how and when yeah. sort of use that tool in your toolbox. The, the other thing that I think maybe goes along with this is, is an interesting one is how you accept compliments and how you accept praise. Um, and I'll be curious to hear maybe if there's gender things going on here, but I hear both mess these up. But I've learned over time that when, when somebody says something kind about like a podcast or a book or whatever, that a genuine look them in the eye and say, thank you. Don't discount. Don't say, oh, well, it could have been better or oh, I don't really like it. Oh, no. Just say, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you. I I'm, I'm glad that my work has impacted your life. Thank you. It is better. But what do you, for both, and maybe this is more for girls, I don't know, but what, what, how about accepting praise or accepting compliments? The type of people who listen to this show, Marissa, are the ones 
who are doing really great work. And so they're, yeah. they're, they're getting praise, they're getting compliments. What, what do you feel is, is, is the proper way to accept praise? Oh, I think you just gave a great example, Ryan, right? Exactly right. what you just did. It's, it's um, you know, it's owning it. And, and then candidly, I think for those who are uncomfortable by it, you know, then it moves, you move on more quickly, right? There's part of it that you're like- How do you it, do it? it? How do you do it? I'm oh, sure. I'm gonna say that, that, well, um, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm the best at it, right? Because I think there's Why? a little bit of me because I'm a perfectionist, right? And so this is something that is not, um, now I'm gonna overshare. It's not um, that- I do always want to make it better than it is, no matter what we're talking about. So there's always a little part of me that wants to share with that. But I think um, I think you're right to say that no, it's really about. Uh, I'm going to put it on my list of something to that I learned from this podcast and continue thinking about to do better on because I think you're right. Um, in part because then it's it's how somebody wants to connect with you, right? Again, you know, if they got something out of it or they're you know thinking you're doing a great job, it's their way of of sort of that two sides of the coin. It's as yeah. impactful for them when you accept the compliment. Exactly. And you just say yes. Exactly. Right? Like, like, thank you. And that that's important for the audience or the sort of the, the sharer of the compliment as well. Um, it's, you know, more as much about them as it is about you, I suppose. Right. Like, don't take the moment away from the person giving mm -hmm. it. I've actually every once in a while met like a you know, an actor, an actress who's been in a big show or movie or in a professional athlete since some of the, the places I've been lucky enough to go. And people say like, oh, you just, you know, play it cool, play it cool, don't whatever. And I've actually found if you give them a genuine, specific compliment about their work, that they love it. And it can create an incredible dialogue with someone. Uh, and, and so if you do like someone's work or you admire their work, tell them with specificity it, it, it will probably, it's not like fanboying or fangirling. It could create a really good conversation. And if you're receiving it, accept it, look him in the eye, say, say, you know, thank you. That means a lot to me. And, it, and, and don't discount the praise. And I know I don't, I didn't expect to go here by the way, but it just seems to come up that, well, I, you know, go ahead. No, it, but it, it also brings us full circle back to our earlier conversation about what to do in those moments when you're with a mentor or and you, when you want to sort of break the ground, right? It's that specificity. It's how you connect with people. Um, and it leads and opens the room for a conversation you may not realize you have. So I think, you know, we just, we went full circle, which is great. Well, I, I do, I am thinking of a personal time. Like my, I, I was in the audience, my wife giving a talk one day and she blew me away, like just crushed it. And I was like, wow, how did you do that? Like remembered a bunch of stuff, like really funny, like a combination of just, just knocked it out. And I, and I go like, that was awesome. Like that was really good. And she's like, no, I messed up this part and I messed that up. It was, ah, I could have been. And I was like, just accept the praise, just accept the compliment. It was really yeah. good. So I think that's good. But when I think about your story though, okay. You flew for the U S Navy. You worked in the white house. You've traveled through the Middle East, negotiated with, with terrorists. You went to Harvard. You go, you get your, your doctorate degree from King's College of London. I mean, <laughs> you've kind of racked it up and you're still young. So like how, uh, it's it, it, for, for, for you, is that just like when you think about all that, or maybe you don't, like what do you think about your career up to this point uh, of all of your accomplishments at a, at a young age? I, I thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, oh, uh, and I, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, I think I've had the good fortune of having a choose your own adventure. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in terms of my career, um, but I think when I look back on it, what really strikes me is that um, I had the wherewithal, um, both sort of personalities wise in that sense, but really the skills to when I saw opportunities go for it, right? And so all the things you just said really came out of like left bank shots that I was like, oh, I'm gonna try this one, try that one, right? Go for it, my go for it moments. Um, and then a team around me who really helped along the way, right? And so when I think about how we help the next generation or when we help each other for your listeners, sort of how do we all create those left bank shots, those moments when there's a ring you go for and you grab it and then it takes you, you swing the ring and it takes you someplace else. Um, how do you find those moments and how do you put yourself in position to seize it, 
right? And that's those lessons of like making yourself super adaptable, right? So that you're not scared by the uncertainty that comes between all those jobs you just mentioned. I was unemployed, right? Right. So there was those moments where between each one, there were moments when I had my like, oh, what happens next, right? Not all of them, but enough of them that I learned to deal with the uncertainty that comes with job changes, right? Um, or this idea that, you know, all of them come with moments of failure, right? We all have to get used to those things and then rebound after. Um, and, you know, I think I, what I hope everyone who's listening um, can remember is we all have the, you know, choose our own adventure paths, um, whatever it may be, right? We have to figure out what that sounds like to each person. I think it's, you know, I had a bit of a, a, a wacky one in my early 20s because I did, you know, pursue the dream of becoming Top Gun and then, you know, pivot from there. Um, but it's the idea that we can create those opportunities and then go for it. And more for more so that there are ways we can position our daughters, mm -hmm. the next generation, to think that way and be prepared to go for it. You know, when they're you know in their twenties and beyond. Speaking of having a daughter, so you share a story about a parent of one of your students named Mark, and this is an example of 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 I want to talk about how to respond when your daughter is going through an issue at school. And you said, Mark told you, I immediately, his daughter, it, it, it was some issue at school. And he said, I immediately went into dad mode. Should I call the school? Do I need to talk to the teacher? I need to do all this. And I, and I, I think this kind of comes natural to dads. I know this feeling, but I also think back to how my parents were for me and realized that while they they're the, they're the greatest. And I hit the parent lottery still to this day. Um, one of the things they were really good at was they never intervene with stuff at school with coaches ever. They didn't tell the coach, oh, he's going to play quarterback or he's the linebacker. They, they just said, hey, we'll sign you up. We'll drop you off. And then it's on you. And when things go bad, you got to figure it out. Now with parents, the snowplow style, you know, it's even more so than the helicopter this is a terrible way to respond when when somebody is struggling at school to feel like I have to go and, and fix it. Can you share the proper way for a dad, this is getting very specific, to respond when his daughter is having an issue? Yep. And so you, um, you're exactly right. And I'm going to use a, a word you use and retool it. Um, it's about coaching, mm. right? The dad needs to think of them, you know, think of yourself as the coach in the situation. Um, the coach from the sidelines, the right. coach who's going to talk your daughter through what to do next so that she can do it herself and practice. Because particularly when our girls are young, elementary school, preteen, teenage, all the way, you know, listen, that they're, you know, before they head off into the real world, by and large, they're in safe environments. They're in places where their teachers, their coach, their advisor wants the best for them. Um, but, and so that's a great place to test the waters, to practice what self-advocacy looks like, practice what it means, you know, for them personally to speak up, to ask for what they need um, and sort of make requests. It may not work out, but they will learn the muscle memory that they need later in life. So for the example, when, you know, your daughter's struggling with something um, in class, it's about coaching her. Okay, well, what happens as, who do you talk to? Okay, so how do you make the appointment? Um, what are you gonna say when you're in the room or what do you say in the email, right? Talk her through what it looks like. And then the next time you drop off at school or sort of say, okay, let me, um, uh, uh, let me know how it goes. I'll pick you up and uh, we'll talk about it, right? It's the setting her up for success, reinforcing that she can do it on her own, coaching her through it. And then the follow-up so that she can, maybe it didn't go well, that's okay. Oh, why? Why not? Oh, did she get emotional or not emotional? Did she not ask for what she wanted in the moment because she got nervous? Is there, you know, these are things that we can talk them through. And the reality is, again, these are the safe moments, right? The perfect example that I, you know, learned in the interviews with my students um, came from a girl who, um, you know, I realized was a master at this um, towards uh, the end of her junior year when um, I got, actually, it was the beginning of her junior year, I got an email from um, a president of a neighboring college um, who had wanted to let me know that an incident had happened on his campus that involved two of my students. And what had happened um, was they were sexually harassed um, on campus while they were walking um, to a waiting car. You know, it was dusk, not dark. 
Um, they were walking by two girls, two you know, teenagers, 16, 17, um, and the two employees um, had started catcalling them, commenting on their body, commenting on what they were wearing, calling after them what they wanted to do with them, things like that. And the girls were terrified as they should have been. They ran to the waiting car where one of their moms was waiting. Um, and you know, of course, first thing, they, they protected themselves, they were safe. But it's what happened next that so impressed me and speaks to exactly what we're talking about um, was they, one of them decided she's gonna email the president. An older white man that you know she didn't know well, but she could find his email online because that's what you, you do these days. And she wrote the most eloquent, thoughtful, well-crafted email. It got forwarded to me later that said, you know, dear sir, I wanted to let you know about an incident that happened on your campus. Describe the incident with detail and concluded by saying, um, if you uh, uh, do, you know, I wonder if you have training on sexual harassment for your employees. Um, if you don't, you should do so. If not, you know, if you have, it's time for a refresher. I'd be happy to discuss it with you, right? Within 24 hours, they got an email back. Within 36 hours, they were in a, a meeting with the head of security and the head of HR and this, this gentleman. Um, and one of their parents didn't even know about it until after the fact. And so this is a moment, right? This speaks to a little bit of different than we're talking about, but you get back to the core of why the girls were able to do that, why they responded that way. And when I interviewed them later and sort of talked about like, how did you learn this? One of them specifically referenced a mo moment when she was about 10 years old and she can remember that her dad used to make her call for pizza. As she put it, not my brother, not my mom, but me. And I hated it. These were her words. Right? She didn't feel comfortable. She didn't want to do it, right? But her dad coached her through it. And she never really liked it. It wasn't her thing. But then later on when she was in middle school and she had trouble in a math test or math class, her dad coached her through how to talk to the math teacher, right? And so on and so forth. And over time, it positioned her for what she needed in the real world. And even though it happened, unfortunately, while she was still in high school, but she responded as we hope all our daughters and all young women would. And yet when we look at statistically, it's not really, it's not often what happens. Only one in four women who are harassed in college report it, right? And so it's the trick is how do you prepare our girls to be ready for that? It's a hard, you know, the unfortunate situation that many of our girls find ourselves in, but it goes back to this coaching from the sidelines lesson, this message that I think all dads out there um, can hopefully find little ways, not about changing everything you do, but just finding little ways to coach. So help, help them find their voice. And there are little tactics along the way, have them order their meal at the restaurant, you don't order for them, have them call to order the pizza, have them introduce themselves and shake hands from a very young age. These little things compound and add up over time to where it just becomes the standard, it becomes the normal thing to do, that you find your voice and and you shared a story about your sophomore year in college when you were training and training for the, for the military. And I think you, you said it was the first time you lost your voice. Um, and I feel like it's a powerful story. Could you share what was going yeah. on then and what you learned from it? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's one that stands out for me. And it was a moment when um, a senior military officer, I was at summer training, um, and uh, a military officer who was senior to me at the time, um, you know, not incredibly senior, but he was a lieutenant and I was just a midshipman. So, you know, very junior, still, still the equivalent of a cadet in training. Um, and he commented that, um, that uh, you know, the pursuit of my dream of flying um, was, you know, I, I don't even think he used the word silly. He just, you know, basically implied it wouldn't happen because I was a girl. He's like, that's not for you, you're a woman. And then he sort of said, ah, well, maybe that's why they'd let you do it, right? As in, you know, the implication of, well, there's a quota, I wouldn't be qualified, but you could get in for that reason. Um, and I remember, and, you know, mind you, I had uh, was fortunate to grow up and go to the school I now lead. So I grew up and went to Baldwin, an all girls school. I grew up in a place where, um, you know, the whole message mission was empowering young women. So I had been perhaps a little protected from sort of that message early on. And so it was one of the first times where so directly um, I was struck with this, um, you know, blatant gender discrimination, blatant bias, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. Um, and, you know, it strikes me as something that I hope every girl has a message in their hip pocket to respond in that moment in a way that feels right to them. Um, but again, that's something that starts young. 
right? So it's about learn teaching your girls their voice and then helping practice when things don't go right, right? And so those are those other moments too that we can all coach from the sidelines as they're young and help them work their way through it because they'll get better at it when they're, for when they're older. I, I think you mentioned this at the very beginning and I want to, I want to bring it back. Um, practice is very useful. I mean, that's the most, obviously that makes so much sense, but we, we know this yet we don't do it. Like, why wouldn't you practice how to open when you're going to meet someone at a coffee shop or why wouldn't you practice how to order or practice how to walk into an office for your first interview? Why would you not? And I think that is indicative of the way you think. And I, and I think the, 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 the students that you're teaching are so lucky. Um, I would say, given that you're not just thinking about like, okay, let's do leadership philosophy 101. And you start talking about, you know, team of rivals, which is a great book, by the way, but but you get actually real tactical and practical with it. I think that 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 makes so much sense that all of us could learn more from both as leaders and businesses, as well as 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 moms and dads. Yeah, I think it's something we all need to remember at every stage of our lives, every stage of our careers, this idea that um, practice, 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 right? It makes a difference whether you're walking in the room to negotiate or whether you're walking in the room for a big pitch um, or, and I saw this in the White House, right? That, or whether you're walking in the room to brief the president or the chief of staff. I um, mean, it always struck me and I would see this happen when, um, you know, I went in for a, a briefing with the then chief of staff to the president um, and it was myself and another colleague and the other colleague's manager had made him practice, had literally run him through um, the traps. And it was a regular weekly briefing. It wasn't like, you know, there wasn't an audience. It was in the room. It wasn't candidly, it was a big deal because it's the chief of staff of the, of, you know, to the president. Um, but it was just a regular briefing. And yet he knew that every time you practice, you're going to get better. You're going to look better. Your message is going to sound better. Your team's going to look better. So they practiced. And sure enough, right? Like it went more smoothly. The questions went off better. Like he just knew and felt more confident. And that was somebody who wasn't early in their career. That was someone who had already reached, you know, the pivotal, pivotal point of being sort of at the White House briefing, um, briefing the chief of staff. So I think it's something we can all remember and take heart in now with our kids, right? That we're practicing with them too and not in a bad way, you know, almost a funny way. Every moment with them is an opportunity to help them practice, you know, the little things that they might need later on. So yeah, you think we can all and you can it. make it fun. I uh, don't have to feel yeah. like a, a, like crazy work for them, and make it fun about this is this is the way that we work to behave, um, and it, it will benefit us uh, long term. Uh, Marissa, normally I would ask this at the beginning, but I want to bring it uh, at the end because I I I just I absolutely love your story and what you do. Um, th- you spent uh, you know, like I said, you spent time as uh, in the Navy. You spent time with some of the greatest leaders at the White House. Um, you've traveled all over the world. Uh, you've negotiated with terrorists. Um, and so you've seen the good and the bad and everything in between. When you think about leaders who have sustained excellence, what have you found to be some of the virtues or commonalities that they all share? Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll, key on, I'll break it apart into two things. When you say um, you know, the sustained part and the excellence part. I think for the sustained, sustained part, it's really about how we learn from, from failure. And I say failure, I mean failure with a little F, right? The hiccups of every day um, and sort of how we bounce back and what we do next. And I think that's an incredibly important part of being a leader. Um, and it's also an incredibly part, important skill to teach our kids, right? And so I, I think now, you know, the stories I tell um, my, uh, my girls about that time in the white house, when I was in a meeting with the president and didn't say a word, right? Like a big, that was a failure for me in, in many sense. And there's the longer stories in the book. So please encourage you to the why behind it. Right. But it's what happens next, right? They remember it. And then they remember how I rebounded They remember what happens next. Right. And those are moments that are so important, um, for the sustaining of the excellence, right? Because you're going to, we're all going to hit it. Um, for the excellence part of the, the phrase, I'll say it's really about your people. Um, and the most uh, you know, impactful leaders I've worked with or alongside or looked up to um, have all really um, in good times and bad made it about other people. And I can remember when I landed in Afghanistan the first time and, um, and we were talking about General McChrystal earlier, so this came to mind, but um, a colonel I was working alongside 
Um, the very first thing he said as I, I pulled up next to him and sort of plopped down my stuff, he turned to me and said, have you called your mother? And when I admitted I hadn't, he handed me a calling card and he said, go call home. Um, you have to tell your mother you arrived safely. And it has struck me ever since as this moment where, you know, you're in the middle of a war zone in combat. I was there to do a job. And, you know, there's a hundred things we could all have been doing. But the thing that he was most keen to make sure of was that I, as a human being, was okay and that my family knew it too. Um, and I think those are moments um, when we invest in our people in that way, that's where excellence comes from because we're only as excellent as our teams, our organizations. And I know I'm sure for all the leaders listening, you know that too. And this is a particularly an important time right now this year to figure out little ways that we can invest in our people. So, What a great story. Uh, one more question, Marissa. Um, let's say you're speaking directly to the parents of teenage girls. Uh, this is a selfish question, but uh, I know there are others out there. Um, <laughs> what, are, what are some general pieces of life slash parenting advice mm -hmm. for a mom and a dad of teenage girls? Yeah. Oh, um, I know this is big. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to do this. No, too, no. I, I, I had to, I had to. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, um, you know, I, I think parenting is, is so hard. Right. And yet it's about, um, realizing that those small things make a big difference. Mm. Right. So for everyone out there to remember that, um, you know, everything we just talked about in some ways, and now we just added to our laundry long list of things that we need to do to be better managers, better leaders, better people, um, and better parents. Right. And um, parenting is tough enough without adding to it. And yet, um, particularly for our young girls, particularly for our teenage girls, um, little things make a big difference right? They sop up things we're hearing and seeing. They are watching us like hawks sometimes, right? And it doesn't mean we have to be perfect at all, but it just means we have to take small moments to do things like help them practice. Small moments to do things like reinforce how much you value their voice and how you think it's important when you ask them about it. Um, take small moments to make sure that they hear, particularly from the, the dads and their moms, their role models every day, that you think they can do anything, right? Because that's what we hope um, for all of them, right? That no matter where they head next, personally or professionally, they, they know that no door should be closed. Um, and so I just think it's about finding those little moments and reinforcing all those things we just talked about. Wow, thank you. I know I set you up with an impossible question, but you killed it. So thank you so much for being here, Marissa. I, um, I regardless of, of, of if you're a dad of daughters, uh, maybe listening or anybody, um, as we said at the beginning, you don't have to be a feminist to care about these issues, nor do you need a daughter or a sister. You just have to know a girl or a young woman and care about her future. And the book's titled What Girls Need, How to Raise Bold, Courageous, and Resilient Women. And if you're a senior leader and all you care about is your profit and your revenue and success, it's still, it will help you too um, because you'll, you'll learn more about the benefits of having strong women on your team. And uh, the number will go up uh, if that's all you care about. I hope it's not. And I don't think a listener of the show is that way. But I'm just saying if that's a part of it, that is there too. Um, Marissa, where would you send my listeners to learn more about you online? Oh, well, thank you. So my website, um, marissaporges.com, M-A-R-I-S-A-P-O-R-G-E-S.com. And there you can get the book as well as those other um, readings and references for parents, for educators, but also for, as you've said, leaders who want to empower the women on their team and make sure that, you know, we can make them their best selves and it's going to just be helpful for everyone. So. Love it. Again, what girls need, how to raise bold, courageous, and resilient women. Uh, Marissa, I'd love to continue our dialogue as we both progress. This was fantastic. Yeah, it was fun for me too. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Thank you.